This is The New Way We Work from Fast Company Magazine, where we take listeners on a journey through the changing landscape of our work lives and explain exactly what we need to build the future we want. I'm Fast Company Deputy Editor Kathleen Davis. It's September, it's back to school, and even though we've been working over the summer, that back to school feeling of refocusing happens in offices too. So we thought the best way to kick off this season is checking in on the current state of return to office. Pre-pandemic, when we covered the future of work, we would often talk about remote work, a shift that experts saw coming a decade or so down the road, which then, as we all know, happened much more abruptly in the spring of 2020. But here we are, well over three years later, and many companies are still trying to figure out how to coax employees back to the office and how to design hybrid models that work for everyone. Many bosses are clashing with employees who want to stay working remotely or maintain some of that flexibility that they've had over the last few years. We talk to people from a range of industries and roles. I'm a freelance audio engineer. I was actually in commercial real estate, and my specialty was offices. I am an attorney, and I work in Los Angeles. I work at the Fall World Trade Center. I work in Los Alamos, New Mexico as a graphic designer. I'm a business student, future lawyer, possibly, hopefully. Actually, no, let's manifest it. I will be a lawyer. Whatever their preference, remote, in office, or hybrid, most people wanted flexibility and trust from their employers. I feel like a lot of this conversation is just habitual. It's just like, well, it's just time to get everyone back. And it's like, I think there's also like a big trust aspect that may be missing here. It's like, well, do you want them back? Because maybe fundamentally you don't like trust your employees to be doing the right thing. The training can definitely be uh, on Zoom. I understand that having it in person, you know, can be better because you can create this environment of understanding you can get people to know each other and collaborate better but if you are not facilitating that environment then it's totally pointless to have us here you know i think it's a bunch of corporate jargon bullshit and it really it's just about micromanaging people i would not take a job that required me like required me If, if it's an option fine but if they required me to come into the office even one day i would not do it And at the same time, many people mentioned the importance of in-person contact, whether to make communication easier or just to create better relationships. Interaction with people in the community is so important. To be able to see people and to interact, that would be very beneficial to connect with others. I don't particularly like team meeting because it's it's a waste of time. So if you meet everyone in person, it saves a lot of time. You know, a lot of times you have a team meeting it could take over a half hour when, if, when it's in person. If it's 15 minutes, you're done. Of course, laughing and smiling. And like, that's such a good feeling. Like when you see somebody roll their eyes or like, I just feel like that all gets lost when you work remotely. And we spend so much time with the people we work with. Like we should be able to like love and have connections where we work and care about the people. Like it's your community. So if you're going to be there, like, They're real people, and I think when you put a screen in between people, it just removes you from the emotional aspect, which makes us human. On the employer side, we talked to folks from various companies and heard several opinions on how to effectively manage a hybrid or completely remote workforce. It's a challenge many companies are trying to adjust to because interest in remote work is high. Yelp was one of the companies that became fully remote after seeing how effective it was during the pandemic. And Carmen Whitney Orr, chief people officer, said it's had a huge impact on hiring. At Yelp, we have certainly seen a increase in interest in our roles from an overall job application standpoint since we announced our remote posture, as well as some of the things that we're doing around supporting reproductive rights. We've seen an increase in the number of average jobs uh, per posting between like since the beginning of the pandemic uh, through the end of last year. So specifically for our general administrative positions, we've had over 200% increase in applicants for those roles. And our sales roles, we've seen a 25% increase. Um, At the same time, we have reduced the number of days that it takes us to fill uh, those uh, open jobs by six days or 23%. So uh, overall, some pretty significant increases. Um, And right now we are also seeing some gains in in, uh, employee retention as well. 
Thumbtack went from fully in office pre-pandemic to fully remote now. CEO and co-founder Marco Zepacosta says it's been really effective for the company. People point to virtual work and say, look, something's not working. Clearly, virtual work doesn't work. And I think the takeaway is not that virtual work doesn't work, but it requires being more deliberate, explicit, and holding a higher bar when it comes to management practices. And I think it exposes the fact that most companies aren't very good at those things. And so, of course, they're not going to be able to take advantage of this virtual context. They haven't invested in that infrastructure and that capability in an in-person context. So I think that the best companies of tomorrow are going to be ones that access the broadest pool of talent that will require virtual work, but that itself requires a more deliberate and active investment in management and performance management that we're really excited about because we think it makes us better, but it is not something that everybody prioritizes. That might be why the majority of companies aren't quite ready to go fully remote. So how can hybrid office transitions be smoother and less contentious for everyone involved? After the break, some advice from a consultant who works with companies on how to build effective hybrid office policies. There seems to be a pretty big disconnect between what companies want and what employees want when it comes to where work gets done. According to LinkedIn data, 50% of job applicants say that they don't want to be in the office full time and nearly as many, 40% of current employees say that they would quit their job if their boss made them come into the office full time. Meanwhile, the number of job listings that offer remote work has steeply declined. The peak for remote jobs was in March 2020, with over 20% of job listings on LinkedIn offering either fully remote or hybrid options. Compare that to just 8% of job listings at the end of May this year. So how can leaders bridge the divide? Is there a way to craft a return to office policy that makes both bosses and employees happy? The best policy approach to coming back to the office is a team-led model. Helping teams make the decision. So not having a top-level policy, let's say Amazon's having you know, three days a week, RTO, Monday, Tuesday, whatever, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. That is a really bad approach, to be honest. So sorry, Amazon. That's Gleb Sapersky. He's a frequent Fast Company contributor and CEO of the Future to Work consultancy, Disaster Avoidance Experts. He wrote the book, Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams, as well as several other books. So we're over three and a half years into the switch to remote work, and many companies obviously started calling employees back to the office at least a year ago. It seems like we should be past this conversation by now. Why aren't we? Well, we're not because companies are finding that their return to office calls have not been working out very well. There was a survey showing that 42 companies report having more attrition than they expected, meaning that they expected some attrition, but they're actually having more attrition than they expected. Another survey from Greenhouse finds that 70% of employees are ready to jump ship if their companies want more of them to come to the office more often. So I helped 25 companies figure out their transition back to the office by now. And in every company, once we have an established return to the office, there are leaders who want their team members to come to the office more often, but their team members don't. So the problem is that hybrid is not simply a one and done. It's neither fully office centric, not fully remote, but it's kind of like, do you come into the office one day a week? Do you come into the office three days a week? Do you come into the office maybe two days a month? There are so many variations and so many dynamics that are going on. So that's kind of a second reason. One is companies are having more trouble getting people and having more attrition than they expected. Another is that there are so many varieties of hybrid, what you can do. And uh, that's the first, second dynamic. And the third dynamic is that managers are only really learning how to manage hybrid teams now. So this is the big third reason. Managers, when you have people call back into the office, they have not been called back for five days a week. And manager, they've been called back for two days a week, three days a week. Managers don't really know how to lead teams effectively in that setting. It's neither fish nor foul, nor fully in office, nor fully remote. 
you have you're seeing managers have a lot of trouble, and this is a, another reason why the conversation is continuing, why some managers are trying to go from two days a week to three days a week, from three days a week to four days a week, and then they're finding attrition and then rolling it back. So we're seeing a continuous dynamic playing out where it's a back and forth tug of war happening. You mentioned also about hybrid work is that it's not a logistical dilemma. This is something that you, you've said in something that you wrote, that it's not a logistical dilemma, that it's a psychological dilemma and that you kind of can't mandate that people come into the office. You have to make them want to come back in. And we've seen and we've covered some very cringeworthy things that companies are doing to try to get employees back, kind of these like mandated fun things that obviously don't work. It's pretty clear that doesn't work. So what what kind of does work to, to psychologically motivate people to want to come back to the office. An interesting question is these mandated fun things. So the mandated fun thing is not something that works when it's mandated. Let's say you're offering free pizza or free coffee or something like that. What works to encourage people to come to the office is when it serves as a social anchor. And there's a big difference because the main reason you come to the office, there are four things that are best done in the office compared to remotely. So let's go through them kind of as a framework just so we know and we're on the same page. More intense forms of collaboration, synchronous collaboration together with each other, that definitely works better in the office. Another one is nuanced conversations, like about performance evaluations, addressing conflicts, maybe a leader conveying strategy to her or his team. A third thing is mentoring and on-the-job training. Works better in the office, especially the establishment of those initial mentoring, coaching relationships. And the fourth thing is socializing and team bonding. So when you look at why people come to the office, those are the reasons that people come to the office. One of my clients early in the pandemic, they had people after the vaccine starting to come back to the office. And then what the people found in survey groups I did for the client is that, hey, we're coming back to the office, but there's nobody else there. You know, why should I come back to the office if there's nobody else there? What am I just going to sit there and just do my work, which I much better to do at home and not waste an hour commuting to the office, right? So that is not a thing that people really enjoy. And that is something that caused a lot of resistance for going back to the office in that context. Instead, what we did is we created social anchors. We created the company paying for breakfast for people on some days and lunch on some other days. So Monday and two Friday were breakfast days and Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday were lunch days. So people can come to the office knowing that, hey, if I come for a breakfast, I can expect that some other people will be there. If I come for lunch, I could expect that some other people will be there at that time. So those social anchors are actually quite effective. And a lunch meeting or a morning meeting provides a nice natural dynamic for further meetings. So you have breakfast with someone, then you collaborate. Or you have first, you do some work and then you have lunch, or you have lunch and then you do some work together. That's what works. That makes a lot of sense, especially, you know, so I, I'm fully remote. I changed to be fully remote during the pandemic. And I will say that the only times I kind of miss not being in the office are exactly two of those things that you mentioned, the collaboration and the social aspect. But there's another aspect that you mentioned that that makes me think about our return to office policies. We've covered a lot that earlier career folks benefit the most from being in the office. Earlier career folks are actually the ones that want to be in the office more. How could a company go about kind of making different policies for different types of, of employees? The best policy approach to coming back to the office is a team-led model. Helping teams make the decision. So not having a top-level policy, let's say Amazon's having you know three days a week, RTO, Monday, Tuesday, whatever, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. That is a really bad approach, to be honest. So, sorry, Amazon. <laughs> Having that top-level down approach is not helpful for different teams. For example, think about your programmers. If they're working on a typical two-week sprint, it might be helpful for them to come in not at all on one week and maybe for three days the other week when they're finishing up this, or maybe come in when they're starting the sprint and when they're finishing the sprint. So that's a much more helpful approach. Or for accountants, I was just training for accounting a firm. For them, it's much more important to be in at the end of a quarter. And so they will have a schedule where they will come in at the end of a quarter for maybe a whole week. 
and maybe not coming in during the middle of the quarter, maybe once a week, occasionally at the end of the month to close the books and not at all during the middle of the month. Or let's say a sales team. Sales teams often want to come in more frequently because they have engagement with each other and they are mutually want to hear each other's phone calls with clients. It's helpful for them. So different teams have different needs and you want to customize it to the needs of each team. That's why you don't really want to have that one size fits all approach. That's why it's so critical to customize it to the needs of each team and have different teams come in on a different cadence and have a different approach customized for each individual decision maker. That's so fascinating because that's so true that, and we alluded to it earlier that I wanted to talk about the kind of the hybrid model. You know, so many companies, they, they opt for that. Fast Company is one of them. For New York employees, there's a, you know, a three days a week in the, or two days a week in the office hybrid model. A lot of companies are doing that. And a lot of companies are doing, as you said, Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, the certain days of the week for everybody in the office with the thought that then that's going to foster that collaboration because look, everybody's here. And what ends up happening, I think, especially, you know, we've seen where some employees are still remote and some are in the office is exactly what you were talking about. You're sitting there at your desk, still in a Zoom meeting yeah. or looking for a quiet spot. And it's like, why did, why did I commute in? What you just mentioned of having like different functions in at different times isn't something we've seen a lot. It makes a lot of sense. Is there kind of other points that leaders should rethink their hybrid plans or other kind of approaches to a hybrid plan that works? Well, I want to mention about the data for that approach, for the team-led approach. We have Gallup surveys and other surveys which evaluated, hey, there are different companies having this approach. So something like 15% of all companies have the approach that I described. And those are the companies that are seeing the highest engagement and highest productivity. So those are the companies that really are having the best approach out of hybrid. Now, why you don't see that more often is because it's more difficult to do in the setup stage. So you need to set up, you need to figure out, and you need to train managers on how to lead teams in a hybrid modality. So for example, earlier you mentioned that junior staff benefit more from coming into the office more frequently. As part of a team-led model, the manager needs to discuss with the junior staff members and make sure that they do come to the office more often and that when they do come to the office, there are some senior team members present to give them guidance and mentoring. So you'll end up with a peer mentoring effect, with a group mentoring effect, where you'll have, let's say, one senior team member and three junior team members, if it happens to be the case that there's a larger junior team member present. And so you don't need to have lots of senior team members who are fine working more remotely, but having one, two, or three dynamic, three junior team members, that's very helpful for those junior team members. So they might be coming in two or three days a week, and you'll have senior team members coming in one day a week, and they'll be coming in in part to mentor those junior folks. So that dynamic is really helpful and research-driven. Yeah, I, f I feel like so many of the conversations we have on this show come back to the importance of being good managers and not just kind of setting any sort of policy and just hoping it runs smoothly on itself. Do you have any advice or have you seen any success with a hybrid model in which, and this happens, where there are a certain amount of employees who are fully remote because they're probably other parts of the country and some that come into the office at some point. How can those teams work together cohesively and still have that kind of collaboration when some people may be together in the same room and other people are not ever in that same room? What you want to do is create mentoring relationships between people who are in the office and people who are outside of the office. So not simply, what I've, the problem I've seen is that when you have mentoring programs, buddy programs, mentoring programs, they only do mentoring, let's say remote people mentoring remote people and in-person people mentoring in-person people. That creates disparities and that creates disconnection. So you want to have mentoring relationships between people who are remote and people who are in the office and people who are in the office and people who are remote. So you want junior people to have at least two mentors in that sort of setting, one who is in the office and one who is remote to give them the benefit of both kinds of frameworks. And the in-person mentor can do co-working together with the mentee when they're in the office. So that's great. The Remote mentor can do virtual co-working. So the, you have team members 
the two of them dial into a video conference call and they intend to work on their individual tasks. But if a junior person has a question, they can get it quickly answered during that period. So they can do it for an hour or a day or so. And that is a very helpful technique. Another dynamic is you want to create team bonding for the people who are present remotely. That means bringing them in occasionally, like once a quarter or so, and having team events for them. So bonding events, social events, maybe a little bit of strategy planning. But the main thing is to have team bonding because you want that trust, you want that connection. And that's the second thing you want to do. And the third thing you want to do is have social events that include these remote team members, like virtual coffee roulette, where you randomly get matched with someone, someone who's in the office gets randomly matched with someone who's remote once a week for a 30-minute chat about life and connection, connecting with them. And the company would pay a little bit for their coffee. So that's another activity that you can do to connect people who are remote to people who are in the office. So you've mentioned in, in some of your other coverage that there are four different types of people or four different types of reactions to being asked to come back into the office. Can you explain what those four kind of reactions or types of people are? Sure. So one big problem you have is resistance. And that is, you have both obvious resistance, public resistance, and you're seeing that with some folks from Amazon the walking out and signing petitions against them. You also see that with people leaking information to the media like us about what's going on inside their company. And then you also have non-compliance. They may come to the office but they may come for an hour or two each day if they're supposed to come for three hours. There's a reason you see so many companies like Amazon, Meta, Goldman Sachs threatening to fire employees or punish them, Google, including their attendance in the performance review, because these are all resistors and they're not coming to the office. And what tends to happen, the resistors tend to be people who are somewhat more senior. They are more established. They know that they can get away with it. I speak to managers every day, and some managers tell me that, hey, I'm just kind of covering for my employees who are not coming to the office. I don't want them to lose them. I don't want to have trouble with them. I don't want them to have conflicts. And these rules from above are not really very helpful or very relevant for my team. And so that is definitely one category of folks. Second category of people is attrition. So you'll definitely have people who are somewhat different from the resistors. These are people who have good talents available elsewhere. So they simply leave the company after the company announces their RTO or after they're threatened to be disciplined for some way of resistance. So that's another category of people. The third category of people is people who tend to be somewhat more junior, somewhat less established, also people who may not have as desirable skills, and these are people who engage in quiet quitting. So quiet quitting has been widely used as a term. It refers to disengagement. You're doing your job, but barely well enough that you're not getting in any trouble. So that's quiet quitting. So you're giving 80% <laughs> to the job. And we're seeing very clearly and extensive surveys have shown that the people who have the most disengagement are remote capable workers who are forced to be in the office when they don't want to be in the office and they think that they're coming to the office to do the same thing that they would do at home. Why would you come into the office and write reports or do programming? Those are not helpful things to do in the office. It's much better to do that individual head down work at home. Why would you write email in the office? And the fourth category is kind of a subcategory where the, you're seeing losses of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So these are underrepresented groups, minority groups, who extensive research shows have less of a desire to be in the office and more of a desire to work remotely than people who are in the white mainstream majority. So for example, when you're looking at knowledge workers, there was a survey by Future Forum that showed that 39% of white knowledge workers want to work remotely full-time. By comparison, 50% of black knowledge workers want to work remotely full-time. And you have similar numbers for other categories. Women have a much higher desire. So the conference board had a survey showing that 78% of women think that flexibility is really important to them compared to 61% of men. So that's another dynamic that you see in that group. This people with disabilities are a huge question here because people with disabilities 
have much more difficulty coming into the office, especially if they have mobility issues. So that's a big issue. But another issue is people, let's say, with long COVID conditions like fatigue and brain fog, who have much stronger desire to work remotely and for whom it's much easier. And they were able to work remotely during the pandemic. Now we have a number of lawsuits where they're suing their company saying, why are you forcing me to come in? I did my job well remotely. And the ADA says I should be able to do my job remotely. And we're seeing them win a number of these lawsuits. That's really useful, I think, to know those when I think leaders see people are not responding to my in-office mandate. And it's just because they don't want to. I think that, you know, what you just outlined is really useful to understand, like, okay, well, let's look at why these people aren't coming in. Apple is another one that that faced some very public backlash last spring as it increased the number of days that it required employees to be in the office, tracking badge scans, disciplining people who didn't come in. You know, as you mentioned, we've heard companies using office attendance in performance reviews. These all seem like awful ideas, yet somehow they're still happening. Um, You know, what are some of the, the common mistakes like that that companies and managers make when they're trying to implement or enforce in office or hybrid policies and like and what can they do if they you know they they ask people to come back and they're not coming back instead of these kind of punitive things so what the mistakes are you kind of outline some mistakes those are punishments are not helpful if you want people to be retained if you don't want people to quite quit to disengage if you want to keep up morale if you want people to collaborate together effectively another thing that i've seen that leaders don't really re- think about sufficiently is people coming in, putting on their headphones and just sitting at their desks and refusing to collaborate, interact with people. That's another form of quiet quitting where you might do your task, you might do your individual work fine, you might do it at 100%, but you do your collaborative work at like 50% because you're deliberately disengaging because you're feeling really resentful about the boss forcing you to come in to do collaboration, kind of just to uh, even though you're there and you're actually working on your individual tasks, because obviously you can do collaboration in a much shorter period of time than you're forced to come to the office. So that is not very helpful at all. So let's think about Amazon as an example. You have the CEO, Andy Jesse, saying that, well, I talked to 60 to 80 other CEOs, and based on these conversations, I decided that I want to everyone to come in three days a week. They didn't do any surveys of their employees, which is shocking. When you think of Amazon using data, I mean, how, how much surveys do they do, do they do of us as customers who use Amazon products, right? <laughs> but they didn't do any surveys of their employees before deciding to do the three days a week in the office mandate, which was suddenly imposed and without any discussions, just going from, yeah, we'll do whatever the team wants to do to three days a week in the office. And not only that, but you have to move to one of these Amazon hub cities, whereas previously you can go to your local office, which, again, very (laughs) harmful for people's well-being and productivity, engagement, collaboration. We talked to Jenny Carlier, the vice chair of talent at EY. She said that they've done lots of surveys and focus groups with employees and learned that many people had barriers to coming in that they didn't have before the pandemic. And for some, it was the increased cost of childcare. It was they owned a pet or adopted a pet under COVID, and now they did not have the means to take care of that pet during the day. Or the commuting costs had increased significantly post-COVID. And so we actually looked at a, an EY Wow fund. We call, and I call it EY Wow because it's EY way of working. And we looked at a fund, and it was a pilot, to see, okay, if we offered reimbursement for some of these barriers that our people told us about, would that truly bring people back into the office? And we saw a 150% increase in people's attendance to the office when we provided that fund. And so we have renewed that again this year, is a means to help our people overcome some of those barriers. When leaders are thinking about perks and like what incentivizes people to come into the office, like commute is always kind of the number one thing people complain about, subsidizing people's commutes and then, yeah, subsidizing childcare, subsidizing like the things that people will take like free childcare and a free commute over free pizza any day of the week, you know, yeah. You will have those conversations and you want to have empathy toward people who need to disrupt their lives. So one of the companies I worked with, the CHRO, moved away to care for her ailing father. 
And when the company decided to do an RTO, she was really sad. She kind of honestly lost a boardroom battle about that, but she was really sad for herself, for the other staff. She knew they would have retention issues, but she at first didn't want to share her story. And I encouraged her to share her story saying that, hey, she'll have a lot of trouble moving back to the corporate campus, finding someone to take care of her ailing father. That's going to be a struggle that she will deal with. So you want to have empathy and you want to show that you're struggling with this. You understand where your employees are coming from. So that empathy is a really important component. And then you need to get on the same page about really what is the office for. So I talked about the best things to do in the office. Collaboration, socializing, mentoring, team bonding. So you want to get on the same page about these sorts of things. What are the shared communicate, collaboration expectations, communication expectations? How do we collaborate? Why should we come to the office? So you want to convince people that, hey, these are the reasons that we should come to the office, and this is what our team decided, and this is what the company has decided as a broad-level guideline policy for the team about why we should come to the office. Now, some people may still not like it, but they'll feel heard, and they can very reasonably infer and understand that, yes, collaboration is better done in the office for the large majority. But collaboration can be so difficult to manufacture. I think a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, we see a lot of people say like, okay, come back into the office so you can collaborate. And then you do exactly the thing you were just talking about where you just sit at your desks. Or even if you're like, oh, let's have a brainstorming meeting every Wednesday when everyone's in the office and then kind of crickets, you know, like how, what are the best ways to kind of fulfill that promise of in-person collaboration? So what you want to do is set shared expectations. And that's part of that is formulating team level guidelines for when you're coming to the office. So again, what and what you're coming into the office for so that people know, OK, I'm coming into the office to do these four activities that are best done in the office. One of them is that synchronous collaboration. And you have those shared expectations that, OK, I'm coming to the office and let's say Tuesday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. is collaboration time. So setting some timelines, so it's not all the time that you're in the office, but a certain period of time, or you can do you know, Thursday, 2 to 4, whatever you want to do. You can do it something like after lunch or before lunch or after breakfast. So some period of time when people know that they should not be have their headphones on, that is not a time to have your headphones on, that's a time to be open to, to schedule both schedule activities and more informal activities. When anyone should be open to anyone else on the team, or if you have a department level, or if you have collaboration across departments where you coordinate at the same amount at the same time, that anyone should be open to other people coming to them and talking to them. And being okay with being less productive during that time is critical, so that the manager doesn't expect you to fulfill deadlines in that period, and so that you don't schedule over meetings, but you keep that time for those more informal, spontaneous collaborations as well as scheduled activities. That reminds me of, you know, pre-pandemic times in the office, especially in a newsroom, I would overhear, you know, this is a famous website, right? Overheard in the newsroom, you would overhear conversations and then like, oh yeah, and chime in. And, and that's how sometimes ideas would come about. But it was definitely not manufactured. It's definitely not something you can be like, okay, the three of you, come up with some ideas now. So so yeah, that's a, that's a great suggestion. We've talked about a lot of this and I kind of want you to weigh in. I think I know what you're going to say, but over the summer you wrote an article for Fast Company about a bunch of the new research around remote hybrid and fully in office work and you've touched on a lot of that already. Where does the research land and where do you personally land on the debate of what's best? Re fully remote, hybrid, fully in office? So it's going to be a nuanced question. So when you look at the research, for my clients specifically, 23 of the companies that I worked with chose a hybrid first model, a flexible one with a team led approach with some top level guidelines. Two of them chose a fully remote model. And when you're looking at companies that tend to go in the fully remote direction, just talk about those. Those tend to be companies that are young companies and tech oriented companies. So those companies are ones that are most likely to have a really flexible model. The more tech like and the more younger companies they are and the smaller they are, the more likely they are to have more flexibility. Larger companies, older companies, more established ones tend to have more of a hybrid modality and have more structure. And so that is something that we're just seeing that division. So I think the future is going to be 
a dynamic one where a number of companies that are right now young, they have established a culture of being very flexible. And those are really the companies, especially the tech companies, that we can expect to be the leaders of tomorrow, whether it's through AI, other technology, they are going to grow and they're going to be successful. So those are companies that I think will we'll pretty clearly see that there will be more flexibility going on. We're also seeing that through a couple of other dynamics. We have more technology, more and more technology that enables easier and easier remote work, flexible work. For example, generative AI is making meetings transcription easier. It's making it's easier to coordinate, to find information. One of the big reasons that leaders are saying, well, you need to come to the office, is that you can quickly converse with other people and get information that you need from them without taking time to write a Slack message or an email, something like that. When you're having AI that's integrated into a company, it can extract information very quickly and easily. There's less need for that in-person coordination collaboration. So people can spend more time working remotely, comparatively speaking. That's an example. The second is that managers are increasingly, I'm training managers, other folks are training managers to work more effectively in a hybrid setting, in a remote setting. So managers are learning the skills that they need. Fast companies writing articles that are helping managers learn, like the one I wrote, about how to work in a hybrid modality, in a more flexible modality. So managers are learning these skills. And as managers are learning these skills, they will be more comfortable with having their team members spend more time working remotely and keeping something we didn't talk about yet, but making sure that people are productive and accountable when they work remote. It, it does sound like the, you know, the future is, as you said, more increasingly remote. It does seem like there is a, a place for hybrid, especially when doing it correctly. Thank you very much. I think this is going to be really helpful. Thank you very much, Kate. I appreciate you inviting me. And that's all for this episode. If you're a new listener, be sure to subscribe to The New Way We Work wherever you listen. And if you like this episode, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And we want to hear from you. Work is changing every day. What's the most pressing issue on your mind? Email us at podcast at fastcompany.com. The New Way We Work is produced by Joshua Christensen and Julia Shu with editing by Nicholas Torres. 